My name is Jim Cregan. I will be revisiting the events and several scenes from the Russian Revolution. Marilyn Falk Downey will also give several readings. At the beginning of 1917, Russia has been through nearly two and a half years of World War I, sustaining massive casualties on the Eastern Front. Living conditions are becoming steadily worse in a country that was already the poorest of all the belligerent powers. At the end of February, bread supplies are running low in the capital city of Petrograd, and women came out in the tens of thousands to proclaim their anger in the streets on a socialist holiday called International Women's Day. Uh, they are soon followed by hundreds of thousands of workers who defy the whips and bullets of soldiers and mounted Cossacks to demand the abdication of the Tsar. By early March, the end of February by the old Julian calendar, the Romanov dynasty, absolutist monarchs who had ruled the empire with an iron hand for 300 years, are gone forever. Thus ends the first so-called February Revolution. It will be only a prologue to a second far more radical upheaval. Who is to fill the void created in the midst of a world war by the Tsar's downfall? Former ministers from the State Duma, an advisory body to the Tsar, form a provisional government composed of moderate liberals, soon to be joined by moderate socialists, to govern the country, supposedly until the convocation of a popularly elected constituent assembly, which will draw up a constitution. But the provisional government refuses to set a date for elections to the assembly, and wants to subordinate all questions and all demands from the people, from what it regards as the overridingly urgent task of winning the war. The Russian people have other ideas. The war is becoming more unpopular by the day. City workers, who have a history of revolutionary struggle, are becoming more and more restless. And the peasants, who form the overwhelming majority of the population, hunger for land. So, into the power void steps another body, the Workers' and Soldiers' Soviet, centered in Petrograd, together with many local Soviets throughout the country. Soviet is simply the Russian word for council, uh, these councils, elected democratically from the factories and military regiments, are the only representative bodies the people have, and they look to them for guidance. At first, the Soviet cooperates with the provisional government. Workers and soldiers elect a group of moderate socialists to its executive. One of the Soviet leaders, Alexander Kerensky, leaves the Soviet eventually to become the provisional government's chief. But the rift between the government and the masses continues to grow as peasants begin to seize the land from big landlords and soldiers start to desert. In April of 1917, the increasingly dissatisfied masses acquire a leader. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin returns from exile in Switzerland to a hero's welcome at Petrograd's Finland station. He is the head of the most militant and revolutionary group of socialists called Bolsheviks. The more moderate socialists are called Mensheviks. Lenin astounds the Mensheviks and other socialist moderates who greet him at the Finland station, and even many leaders of his own party, by calling for an end to the war, the overthrow of the bourgeois provisional government, a land to the peasants, factories to the workers, and all power to the Soviets. He declares that the Russian Revolution is a spark that will ignite workers' revolutions in Europe and around the world. An eyewitness to the scene, the more moderate socialist Boris Sukhanov wrote, suddenly before the eyes of all of us, completely swallowed up by the routine drudgery of the revolution, there was presented a bright, blinding, exotic beacon, obliterating everything we lived by. Lenin's voice, heard straight from the train, was a voice from the outside. There had broken in upon us, in the revolution, a note that was not, to be sure, a contradiction, but that was novel, harsh, and somewhat deafening. In May, another exile of prominence returns to Petrograd from his most recent place of exile in New York City. 
He is the 37-year-old Leon Trotsky, who won fame as the chairman of the Petersburg Soviet in the earlier aborted revolution of 1905. He is an outstanding writer and one of the greatest orators of his time. Trotsky has, up to his return, been a bitter factional opponent of Lenin among Russian socialists. But now he finds himself advocating all power to the Soviets, a course identical to that being urged by Lenin. Their convergence of views persuades Trotsky to put aside past differences and join the Bolsheviks, where he will become second only to Lenin as a leader of the impending Second Revolution. In the beginning, Lenin, Trotsky, and the Bolsheviks are in a minority, but events are moving fast. In June, the provisional government announces a new offensive on the Eastern Front. In July, it reveals its plans to transfer the Petrograd garrison to the front. The soldiers of the garrison demand the overthrow of the provisional government. The Bolshevik leadership, on the other hand, believes that the country as a whole will not yet support an insurrection and tries to restrain the soldiers and sailors. But, ignoring the counsels of their leaders, the soldiers and sailors stage a militant armed demonstration, which government troops are brought in to suppress. The defeat of what would become known as the July Days greatly emboldens all right-wing forces in the country. The charge that Lenin is a German agent, which gains wide currency for a while, is based partly on the fact that Lenin had gone back to Russia in April on board a sealed train arranged by the German government. The charge is a lie, yet Lenin is indicted and forced to flee to Finland. Other Bolshevik leaders, including Trotsky, are jailed. The government indicts Lenin as a German agent, forcing him to flee to exile in Finland. But the right-wing post-July mood proves short-lived. The left finds the wind again in its sails in the wake of what will become known as the Kornilov Affair. By September, all of the country's privileged classes are looking for a strong man to restore order at the front and put an end to the Soviets once and for all. They think they have found such a figure in Lavr Kornilov, a czarist officer. But Alexander Kerensky, now the leading figure in the provisional government, wants Kornilov to put down the Soviets under his command. Kornilov, on the other hand, desires to be dictator of Russia himself, and so moves to crush Kerensky along with the Soviets. For his part, Kerensky cannot defend himself without the aid of the Bolsheviks, who now wield decisive influence among the soldiers and sailors. Trotsky and other leading Bolsheviks are released from prison, and head of the effort to thwart the coup. Kornilov's attempt to make himself the savior of old Russia is defeated by the organized efforts of soldiers and workers who derail his troop trains headed for Petrograd. Kornilov's men are then persuaded by the armed workers to desert their commander and go over to the revolution. The Bolsheviks receive credit for Kornilov's defeat and pressure now begins to grow for new elections to the Soviets aimed at deposing the executive comprised of moderate socialists who support the provisional government and replacing them with a revolutionary leadership who support the Bolshevik slogans of peace, bread, land and Soviet power. It is in this phase of the revolution that John Reed, in his famous journalistic account, Ten Days That Shook the World, reports the following exchange between a right-wing socialist and a member of the armed workers' militia called the Red Guards. We sailed out into the town. Just at the door of the station stood two soldiers with rifles and bayonets fixed. They were surrounded by about a hundred businessmen, government officials and students, who attacked them with passionate argument and epithet. The soldiers were uncomfortable and hurt, like children unjustly scolded. A tall young man with a supercilious expression, dressed in the uniform of a student, was leading the attack. You realize, I presume, he said insolently, that by taking up arms against your brothers you are making yourselves the tools of murderers and traitors? Now, brother, answered the soldier earnestly, you don't understand. 
Uh, there are two classes, don't you see? The proletariat and the bourgeoisie. We... Oh, I know that silly talk, broke in the student rudely. A bunch of ignorant peasants like you hear somebody bawling a few catchwords. You don't understand what they mean. You just echo them like a lot of parrots. The crowd laughed. I am a Marxian student, and I tell you that this isn't socialism you are fighting for. It's just plain pro-German anarchy. Oh, yes, I know, answered the soldier, with sweat dripping from his brow. You are an educated man, that is easy to see, and I am only a simple man. But it seems to me... I suppose, interrupted the other contemptuously, that you believe Lenin is a real friend of the proletariat. Yes, I do, answered the soldier, suffering. Well, my friend, do you know that Lenin was sent through Germany in a closed car? Do you know that Lenin took money from the Germans? Well, I don't know much about that answered the soldier stubbornly. But it seems to me that what he says is what I want to hear, and all the simple men like me. Now there are two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. You are a fool! Why, my friend, I spent two years in the Schusselburg for revolutionary activity when you were still shooting down revolutionists and singing God Save the Tsar. My name is Vasily Grigorovich Panyan. Didn't you ever hear of me? I'm sorry to say that I never did, answered the soldier with humility. But then, I am not an educated man. You are probably a great hero. I am, said the student with conviction. And I am opposed to the Bolsheviki, who are destroying our Russia, our free revolution. Now how do you account for that? The soldier scratched his head. I can't account for it at all, he said, grimacing with the pain of his intellectual processes. To me it seems perfectly simple, but then I'm not well educated. It seems like there are only two classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. There you go again with your silly formula, cried the student. Only two classes, went on the soldier doggedly, and whoever isn't on one side is on the other. Reed also visits soldiers at the front and describes their thirst for information and knowledge. At the front, the soldiers fought out their fight with the officers and learned self-government through their committees. In the factories, those unique Russian organizations, the factory shop committees, gained experience and strength and a realization of their historical mission by combat with the old order. All Russia was learning to read and reading politics, economics, history, because the people wanted to know in every city in most towns along the front. Each political faction had its newspaper, sometimes several. Hundreds of thousands of pamphlets were distributed by thousands of organizations and poured into the armies, the villages, the factories, the streets. The thirst for education so long thwarted burst with the revolution into a frenzy of expression. From Smolny Institute alone the first six months went out every day, tons, carloads, trainloads of literature saturating the land. Russia absorbed reading matter like hot sand drinks water, insatiable. And it was not fables, falsified history, diluted religion, and the cheap fiction that corrupts, but social and economic theories, philosophy, the works of Tolstoy, Golgo, and Gorky. Then the talk besides which Carlyle's, quote, flood of French speech, unquote, was a mere trickle. Lectures, debates, speeches, in theaters, circuses, schoolhouses, clubs, Soviet meeting rooms, union headquarters, barracks, meetings in the trenches at the front, in village squares, factories. What a marvelous sight to see Pitilovsky Vlabod, the Putilov factory, pour out its 40,000 to listen to social democrats, socialist revolutionaries, anarchists, anybody, whatever they had to say, so long as they would talk. For months in Petrograd and all over Russia, every street corner was a public tribune. In railway trains, streetcars, always the spurting up of impromptu debate everywhere. 
and the all-Russian conferences and congresses drawing together the men of two continents, conventions of Soviets, of cooperatives, zemstvos, nationalities, priests, peasants, political parties, the Democratic Conference, the Moscow Conference, the Council of the Russian Republic. There were always three or four conventions going on in Petrograd. At every meeting, attempts to limit the time of speakers voted down, and every man free to express the thought that was in him. We came down to the front of the 12th Army, back of Riga, where gaunt and bootless men sickened in the mud of the desperate trenches. When they saw us, they started up with their pinched faces and the flesh showing blue through their torn clothing, demanding eagerly, did you bring anything to read? As more and more Bolsheviks are elected to local Soviets every day, the new elections for the all-Russian Soviet in Petrograd are finally scheduled. Lenin becomes convinced that the country as a whole will support Soviet power. But he also realizes that the provisional government will not peacefully step aside in favor of the Soviets. He therefore pushes the Bolshevik party to make plans for an insurrection. The date for the insurrection is finally set to coincide with the opening of the Second Soviet Congress on November 7th, October 25th by the old calendar. The Soviet organizes the Military Revolutionary Committee, headed by Trotsky, to conduct the operations of the Red Guards, a Soviet force made up of armed workers. Election returns for the all-Russian Soviet revealed that the workers, soldiers, and sailors of the country have given the Bolsheviks an absolute majority. Sukhanov describes a speech given by Trotsky at this time to a packed hall. All around me was a mood bordering on ecstasy. It seemed as though the crowd, spontaneously and of its own accord, would break into some religious hymn. Trotsky formulated a brief and general resolution or pronounced some general formula like, quote, we will defend the worker-peasant cause to the last drop of our blood, unquote. Who is for? The crowd of thousands, as one man, raised their hands and burning eyes of men, women, youth, soldiers, peasants, and typically lower middle class faces. Trotsky went on speaking. The innumerable crowd went on holding their hands up. Trotsky wrapped out the words, quote, Let this vote be your vow, with all your strength and all your sacrifice, to support the Soviet that has taken on itself the glorious burden of bringing to a conclusion the victory of the revolution and bringing land, bread, and peace, unquote. The vast crowd was holding up its hands. It agreed. It bowed. Lenin, however, her greatly fears that a prolonged formal debate in the Soviet about whether or not to assume power will give the counter-revolution a chance to regroup, take the offensive, and crush the Soviets. In fact, government forces are already on the move, shutting down a Bolshevik printing press and attempting to raise the bridges over the River Neva to deny workers access to the center of Petrograd. Under the direction of the Military Revolutionary Committee, the Soviet mounts a defensive operation which soon passes over onto the offensive, as Red Guards now seize government barracks and telegraph posts throughout the city. By the time the Second Congress opens the next day, the delegates are handed the news that the government has already fallen and that power has passed into their hands. In his 1928 film, October, the renowned Soviet director, Sergei Eisenstein, depicts the storming of the Tsar's winter palace by masses of workers and soldiers. The story is a myth, arising perhaps from the need to provide for the revolution a missing Bastille storming moment. The revolution in Petrograd is virtually peaceful and bloodless. A few shells are, in fact, fired at the winter palace, where the last remnants of the provisional government are huddled after Kerensky fled. But they kill or injure no one and members of the government finally surrender voluntarily. The palace, however, was the scene of another drama, recollected by the leading Bolshevik, Antonov Ovsienko, in his memoirs. A wild and unexampled orgy spread over Petrograd, and until now it has not been plausibly explained 
whether or not this was due to any surreptitious provocation. Now here and now there, crowds of ruffians appeared, mostly soldiers, broke into wine cellars and sometimes pillaged wine shops. The few soldiers who had preserved discipline and the Red Guards were worn out by guard duty. Exhortations were of no avail. The cellars of the Winter Palace, the former residence of the Tsar, presented the most awkward problem. The Priobrzezinski regiment, which had hitherto kept its discipline, got completely drunk while it was doing guard duty at the palace. The Pavlovsky regiment, our revolutionary rampart, did not withstand the temptation either. Mixed guards, picked from different detachments, were then sent there. They too got drunk. Members of the regimental committees, i.e. the revolutionary leaders of the garrison, were then assigned to do guard duty. These two succumbed. Men of the armored brigades were ordered to disperse the crowds. They paraded a little to and fro, and then began to sway suspiciously on their feet. At dusk, the mad bacchanals would spread. Let us finish off the czarist remnant. This gay slogan took hold of the crowd. We tried to stop them by walling up the entrances. The crowd penetrated through the windows, forced out the bars, and grabbed the stocks. An attempt was made to flood the cellars with water. The fire brigade sent to do this themselves got drunk. Only the sailors from Helsingfors managed to render the cellars of the Winter Palace harmless. This was in its way a titanic struggle. The sailors stood firm because they were bound by a severe comradely vow, death to anyone who breaks the oath. And although they themselves were at other times magnificent tipplers, they came off with flying colors. This was not yet the end of the struggle. The whole city was infected by drinking madness. At last, the Council of People's Commissars appointed a special commissar, endowed him with emergency powers, and gave him a strong escort. But the commissar, too, proved unreliable. A bitter struggle was in progress at the Vasilevsky Island. The Finnish regiment, led by men with anarcho-syndicalist leanings, declared a state of siege on the island and announced that they would blow up the wine cellars and shoot plunderers at sight. Only after an intense effort was this alcoholic lunacy overcome. Back at the All-Russian Soviet Congress, Lenin, coming out of hiding for the first time in months, casts off his disguise and ascends the rostrum to declare, We shall now proceed to construct the socialist order. Reed describes the scene at the Soviet headquarters at the Smolny Institute. The massive facade of Smolny blazed with lights as we drove up and from every street converged upon it streams of hurrying figures, dim in the gloom. Automobiles and bicycles came and went. An enormous elephant-colored armored automobile with two red flags frying from the turret lumbered out with screaming siren. It was cold, and at the outer gate the Red Guards had built themselves a bonfire. At the inner gate, too, there was a blaze, by the light of which the sentries slowly spelled out our passes and looked us up and down. The canvas covers had been taken off the four rapid-fire guns on each side of the doorway, and the ammunition belts hung snake-like from their breeches. A dun herd of armored cars stood under the trees in the courtyard, engines going. The long, bare, dimly illuminated halls roared with the thunder of feet, calling, shouting. There was an atmosphere of recklessness. The crowd came pouring down the staircase, workers in black blouses and brown black fur hats, many of them with guns slung over their shoulders, soldiers in rough, dirt-colored coats and gray fur shopkey, pinched flat, a leader or so, Lunacharsky, Kamenev, hurrying along in the center of a group, all talking at once with harassed, anxious faces, and bulging portfolios under their arms. The extraordinary meeting of the Petrograd Soviet was over. I stopped Kamenev, a quick-moving little man with a wide, vivacious face set close to his shoulders. Without preface, he read in rapid French a copy of the resolution just passed. 
The Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies saluting the victorious revolution of the Petrograd proletariat and garrison particularly emphasizes the unity, organization, discipline, and complete cooperation shown by the masses in this rising. Rarely has less blood been spilt, and rarely has an insurrection succeeded so well. The Soviet expresses its firm conviction that the workers and peasants' government, which, as the government of the Soviets, will be created by the revolution and which will assure the industrial proletariat of the support of the entire mass of poor peasants, will march firmly towards socialism, the only means by which the country can be spared the miseries and unheard of horrors of war. The new workers and peasants' government will propose immediately a just and democratic peace to all the belligerent countries. It will suppress immediately the great landed property and transfer the land to the peasants. It will establish workmen's control over production and distribution of manufactured products and will set up a general control over the banks, which it will transform into a state monopoly. The Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies calls upon the workers and the peasants of Russia to support with all their energy and all their devotion the proletarian revolution. The Soviet expresses its conviction that the city workers, allies of the poor peasants, will assure complete revolutionary order, indispensable for the victory of socialism. The Soviet is convinced that the proletariat of the countries of Western Europe will aid us in conducting the cause of socialism to a real and lasting victory. The session concludes with the triumphal singing of the Internationale. Thus, on November 7th, 1917, takes place the Second Russian Revolution, known by the old Russian calendar as the October Revolution. It would inaugurate the 20th century in earnest, and change the world forever. The Mensheviks and other right-wing socialists who walked out of the Soviet in protest on that day accused the Bolsheviks of staging a coup. And this charge has been repeated down the decades, not least of all by many historians today. And if it is meant by this that the October Revolution was not a mass event, like the storming of the Bastille, but a carefully organized and prepared action there is some truth here, but if, as is more frequently met, it represented an attempt by a small band of zealots to impose their will upon a hostile or indifferent people, the charge must be rejected. The October Revolution was the culmination of what was perhaps the most profound revolutionary process in European history. It represented the emergence of an enormous mass of semi-serfs and wage slaves from being the passive objects of history to being the authors of their own drama. This is simply a fact, however one may evaluate the revolution's ultimate consequences.